I think it's safe for me to say good afternoon. Uh, my name is Les Lilly. I'm one of the transplant hepatologists, actually uh, the, 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 the old one now at Toronto General Hospital. And it's my pleasure to speak to you today uh, about liver transplantation in general, uh, with a focus, uh, of course, on the role of our living donor program in our liver transplant program. Um, there, there we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, uh, and uh, my first slide, if I could see it, just gives you a quick outline. Um, let me just, I'll change my settings here so I can see my own slide. Um, the, I'll start by, by giving you a little bit of a history of our transplant program uh, and how busy we are. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, then, I, then I will um, uh, try and put the whole living donor program in context. Um, so our, our, um, the, the liver transplant program at Toronto General Hospital has the distinction of being the largest adult liver transplant program in North America last year which is remarkable in and of itself, but also remarkable because last year was the year of COVID. And we actually uh, had a marked decline in transplant activity for the first couple of months because of a complete lack of donors and so much uncertainty in the system. So doubly remarkable that we actually were number one in North America last year. But we've been in the top one or top one or top two for the last five years in North America, and we will soon reach the 4,000 mark in terms of number, liver number of, of adult liver transplants done within the walls of Toronto General Hospital at UHN. Not surprisingly, um, the Living Donor Program has paid, played a big part in that. And a few weeks ago, we actually passed Living Donor number 1,000. 800 or so have gone to adults and a couple of hundred of those have gone to children. In addition to our transplant activity, uh, our, our program follows close to 2,000 patients. We have an active waiting list of about 250. We follow about 1,800 recipients long term, and we assess and list or decline uh, three or 400 patients a year. In addition to that, as well, um, we're also internationally known for our groundbreaking research and uh, and for developments in surgical and medical management of liver transplant patients as well. Um, and, and I think we put together a tremendous uh, constellation of, of surgical and medical experts that are designed to achieve the best possible outcomes uh, that we can in every single patient that's referred to us. And that's part of our mission. And it's, it's the driving uh, uh, factor in everything that we do at UHN. Um, you can see from this slide uh, that we squeaked by uh, um, uh, Mayo Clinic uh, Scottsdale as program number one in North America last year. I'm proud to report that this year is proving to be even better uh, and that we're on a pace to set a new record in 2021. And a large part of that I, I, is attributable to increasing activity on the living donor side. Next slide. Yeah. Now, what, what, what is our bread and butter? Uh, and, and it's ironic I put it that way because fatty liver disease, which can be attributed in part to over generous intake of bread and butter, uh, is, is, is an important cause of liver disease requiring transplant. But, you know, we, we, we see an assortment of diseases that all, all lead to liver failure. Secondary cirrhosis, hepatitis B and hepatitis C are still important diseases for us, despite tremendous advances in, in antiviral care. Um, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, makes up 25 to 30% of all the causes of cirrhosis that we see. Uh, uh, we, we continue to see plenty of patients with liver disease related to histories of alcohol misuse. There is a constellation of diseases attributable to an overactive immune system, and they collectively make up 10 to 15% of our transplants, the autoimmune liver diseases. There is a smaller number of patients that have metabolic diseases, inherited diseases that require transplantation. And, and most people are surprised to hear that liver cancer is an important part of what we do. About 40% of all the transplants that we perform are in patients who have liver cancer complicating their underlying liver disease. So it's quite an assortment. There are probably three or four dozen other diseases that aren't included. And if you look at this pie chart, which breaks down our transplant activity over the last five years, uh, you can see um, that roughly hep C alcohol and fatty liver disease each make up about 20% and the rest make up the difference. Uh, uh, the tumor patients aren't included here. Um, uh, what I've done is I've stratified the recipients according to their underlying disease. But as I mentioned already, liver cancer 
uh, primarily or sometimes secondarily makes up uh, close to 40% of all the transplants that we do uh, here at uh, Toronto General Hospital. Now, one of the challenges that we face um, uh, is deciding, you know, irrespective of, of which pathway to transplant the patients end up choosing, we need to decide when, when a patient's liver disease is, is advanced enough that liver transplantation makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, the mere presence of cirrhosis is not enough to, uh, to justify uh, putting someone through the risks and rigors of a liver transplant in, in, in most cases. Um, so so um, what we ask ourselves when we see patients in consultation is we say to ourselves, is this patient's liver disease or, or if it's relevant, their liver cancer, at a stage where liver transplant offers the best chance of both short and long-term success. Uh, and that requires us to have a pretty good understanding of what it will, what's going to happen to this patient if we don't transplant them and what will happen to these patients likely if we do transplant them. And given that there are 60 or 70 liver diseases that ultimately bring patients to see us, this, this is a process that requires a fair bit of experience and thought to, to decide. Um, you know, over the last decade and more, significant develops have been made in the treatment, particularly of viral hepatitis. And, and, and uh, uh, when those treatments first became available, we were fortunate enough, we were able to remove patients from the waiting list as their uh, virus came under control and their liver function improved. Um, some of the patients we list for liver failure related to alcohol uh, will enjoy some improvement in liver function with ongoing abstinence, and they ultimately may not require a transplant. Uh, and there are very specific criteria that we follow in terms of deciding when a cancer patient uh, has gone beyond the point where their cancer has a likelihood of cure with surgery or with ablative therapy or with chemotherapy and when transplant offers the best chance of cure. There's, there's also a subset of patients who struggle with a lot of fluid retention, their bellies are distended, they're having fluid drained every week or two from their belly. And some of those patients, depending upon other factors, might, might actually be eligible to have a metal shunt placed inside their liver, which might save them from needing a transplant or might delay the need for transplant for some years down the road. And so every patient that we see in our assessment clinic, we kind of go through the mental exercise of deciding whether this patient is at the right point in their disease for transplant. And the way I, the way I say this to the patients, I say, okay, we need to imagine that we have a hundred of you in this room. Uh, and we somehow today transplanted 50 and didn't transplant the other 50. And then we look down the road at six months and 12 months and 24 months, et cetera, et cetera, and try to see which side of the, of the equation has the better outcome. And that's essentially what it comes down to. If your individual patient's more likely to be alive and well, alive and well in a year and beyond with a new liver than with the liver that they've got, then it's appropriate to consider them for transplant. Next slide. The, the um, secondarily, once we've decided that someone should have a transplant or should be considered for a transplant, we need to look at other factors in that patient that might affect our success rate. Our transplant patients are getting older uh, and it's important to, to recognize that fatty liver disease occurs predominantly in patients who are overweight, are diabetic, suffer from hypertension and suffer from elevated lipids, cholesterol and triglycerides. And those disorders themselves are separately associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease. So when we assess an individual patient, we have to balance the risks of the surgery uh, versus the benefits, um, uh, uh, taking, into taking into consideration what other conditions or comorbidities they suffer from. And so if, if generally speaking, if, if your potential liver transplant candidate has significant heart disease or lung disease or, or, or sometimes renal disease that might independently shorten their life more than their liver disease will, then a liver transplant may not be appropriate. We, we can't transplant patients who are actively infected outside the liver, and we don't transplant patients who have active untreated malignancy outside the liver as well. It's important to remember when I say liver cancer, for transplant, I'm talking about cancer that arises in the liver itself, not cancer that has arisen in an outside organ, such as the bowel or the pancreas or the breast, 
that's ended up spreading to the liver, although there are experimental protocols going on to deal with metastatic bowel cancer in some patients. Finally, we, we take a step back and we look not at just the patient, but we look at the patient's circumstances. We, we, want, we want to be confident this patient has the support, or as I, as I like to say, their team is as good as our team in terms of getting this patient to, through, and beyond their transplant. So do they have excellent support systems? Do they have basic things in place, like a, a place to live, somebody to bring them back and forth to the hospital and to the lab, um, uh, someone to be there for them if and when they get into trouble, either while they're waiting on the list or whether they're or, or, or post-transplant as well. So, uh, and we also want to assure ourselves that if the, if the liver disease is attributable to alcohol, that we are highly likely to see long-term abstinence, which is a requirement. Uh, that there are no other active substance abuse issues, and that patients, if they struggle with mental health issues, that those issues have been appropriately diagnosed and addressed. Um, you know, livers are scarce. Patients who need liver transplants are not. And whether the, whether the donor liver comes from a deceased individual and is a gift from their family, or whether it comes from a, a, a relative or a friend of the recipient, we want to, to be as confident as we can that we're going to get the best possible outcome uh, 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 in the use of this very scarce resource. Next slide. Now, the most useful tool that we've developed to assess the prognosis of patients with liver disease is called the MELD score. MELD stands for Model for End-Stage Liver Disease, uh, and it's been modified over the years since it first came into use in the, in, 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 uh, the early 2000s uh, to include a serum sodium value. And there are four components to the sodium MELD score, and most of the patients that we see are already familiar with this concept before they come to us. It's been introduced to them by their referring doctors. We measure the bilirubin or the level of jaundice in the patient's blood. We measure the creatinine, which is a marker of kidney function since a, a sick liver often results in sick kidneys. We look at the INR, uh, which is to replace the prothrombin time. Most of your clotting factors are made by your liver. And as your liver sickens, clotting factors are made in fewer quantities and uh, blood clotting deteriorates. And we look at the, the serum sodium level in the blood. This is a marker both of how much extra water the patient retains, but also of the amount of diuretics or water pills that they're taking in order to control their fluid retention as well. And, and to go back to that concept of, of dividing those 100 patients into two groups, the group with a sodium melt score of 15 or higher generally is going to benefit from a transplant. And most patients with a score of 14 or lower, or lower will not. Now, there are, of course, exceptions, as there are in everything in medicine to those, to those rules. But it is unusual for us to list a patient for transplant with a MEL that's uh, solidly under 14. And it's very unusual for us to not consider someone seriously for transplant as the MEL score gets into the upper teens or early 20s. Now, now um, this scoring system works very nicely for patients with cirrhosis and its complications. But, but I did mention some exceptions. For example, if somebody has inherited a liver disease uh, and the liver has become sick as a result of that, they may not necessarily look on paper the same as somebody who is liver disease as a result of a viral, a virus or, or fatty liver disease, for example. Um, there are also um, uh, our, our big group of cancer patients um, uh, who generally have well-preserved liver function. They all have cirrhosis, but they have low MELD scores. And if you listed those patients according to their MELD scores, they would all die of cancer long before they were able to uh, uh, achieve liver transplantation as well. So uh, for every rule, there are exceptions. And in the liver transplant field, there are lots and lots of exceptions that we weigh in, in balance every single day. Next slide. Not only do we use the sodium MEL score to help us to determine when a patient with liver disease is sick enough, the liver transplantation should be considered. We also use it to prioritize the patients once they're listed. <coughs> you know, it would be great if we could just call up all the patients on the waiting list every day and ask them how they're doing. And that's just not practical and not objective enough. So the MEL score gives us a quick and easy and very reproducible way in, in, in the space of a few seconds to assess uh, how someone is doing when they've got bad liver disease. And, and, and so that's the order that, that, that's how the order of patients on the waiting list is determined. 
um, there are there are um, there are more factors as well. Just because someone has the highest melt score on the waiting list doesn't necessarily mean that the liver that's coming along tonight will be offered to them. There has to be some size matching. Sometimes there are other anatomical considerations. Sometimes there are infectious disease considerations. Uh, lots of factors as well. But the, the it's there's it's safe to say that that if you're waiting for a liver and you're and you're waiting for a deceased donor organ, you're unlikely to attract offers until your MELT score is very high. And the average last year was around 30. And if you put that in context, if you if you if you need a liver transplant when your MELT score is over 15, but you don't get one until it's close to 30, that means that there's an awful lot of patients in between who are going to do badly uh, because an organ is just not going to come along at the right time. Um, next slide. Now, liver transplantation works. Um, uh, our outcomes are excellent. I'll show you some statistics uh, at, towards the end of this talk as well. Uh, that is never the issue. The issue, the issue is almost never whether or not a transplant um, is, is likely to be successful. The issue, uh, when you take into account the large numbers of patients that we see, is, is how do we get the, the, the liver into the patients who need it most? And how do we do so before the recipient is so sick that the risks of surgery are become uh, uh, prohibitive? And I joke again with my patients, I talk about the Goldilocks theory of liver transplantation. We want the patients to be not too well and not too sick, we want it to be just right at the time of transplant. And unfortunately in a system where organs are allocated based on the sickest patient in the province, we often miss that opportunity. And we only get to transplant patients when they're very, very sick. And not only does that mean that many patients actually become excluded from transplant because they're too unwell, but also the outcomes, the complication rates uh, and, and the short and long-term success are compromised if you're only ever transplanting patients that are very, very ill. Next. And this translates, unfortunately, into a very sobering statistic. In spite of our increasing transplant activity with, with uh, close to 200 adult livers per year, you can see from this slide over the last decade or more that, that the number of patients, I'm sorry, I need the next slide. The number of patients being removed from the waiting list year on year continues to increase. What I put on this slide is the number of patients who frankly die on the waiting list. Uh, uh, that's the dark green uh, 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 columns. On top of that are the number of patients who are delisted because of tumor progression. There are very strict guidelines in terms of liver cancer and when patients should and shouldn't be transplanted. Uh, and those guidelines, of course, um, I have to be, are, are set and monitored very closely by the Trillium Gift of Life Network, and we follow them along with our colleagues in London. And then there's a significant portion of patients who, who end up being removed from the waiting list because they have so many medical problems that they cannot have, they will not survive surgery. And that number increases year after year after year. So in spite of our transplant program growing in terms of its activity, more patients died on the waiting list last year than in any year in our program's long and storied history. And I, and I can tell you that this year will not be any better. And this is the reality. The gap between supply and demand continues to grow. Liver disease is not becoming less common. Although we are seeing fewer patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C, we are seeing more patients all the time with liver disease due to fatty liver disease, the commonest liver disease in North America is fatty liver disease. More patients with liver disease attributed to alcohol, and, and believe me, the circumstances of the COVID pandemic have not helped that. And also more and more patients with liver disease based on autoimmune causes as well. So, so the challenge that we face is, is number one, finding livers for all the people that need it, but number two, maintaining good outcomes in the setting of this increasingly sick and complex patient population. We have an obligation to use these scarce organs in the best possible way. If we only ever transplanted patients who were in really good shape, our outcomes would be excellent, but our death rates would be atrocious. If we only ever transplanted patients who were super, super sick, then, then, then our outcomes would be terrible and our death rates would be lower, but many of those pre-transplant deaths would translate into unfortunate post-transplant deaths as well. And that's a balancing act that as a program, we continue to struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide. Now, 
the, the purpose of, of, of this presentation um, uh, with the background that I've given you is to highlight the two ways that we accomplish liver transplantation. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, um, the results that I've given you so far, I hope have emphasized how the need for organ replacement is not being adequately met by the supply. And how do we increase the supply? Well, um, you know, we are certainly using the sea stoner livers for transplant today that we wouldn't have used 10 or 15 years ago. We have a very aggressive program in place to try to take livers that are perhaps a little bit uh, iffy and, and put them on special machines and improve the, the health of the donor liver and figure out how to assess that and use those livers as well. And, and that's a growing program across all the organs that we use, lungs, uh, uh, kidneys, and livers as well. But fundamentally, the gap is going to continue to be uh, uh, wider than we can address with those means. So there are two ways that you can get a liver transplant in our program. Uh, one is to sit on the waiting list and hope that you get sick enough to attract the next deceased donor, but not too sick so that you actually have a decent result. Or if you're a cancer patient that, you're, that your tumor remains controlled with all the therapy that we offer to ensure that you're still likely to have a good long tumor-free outcome following surgery. Or, or for most of our patients, as I'll outline, the option is living donation. And this slide has been carefully selected to show you that the road to living donation is shorter than the road to deceased donation. And I'll highlight that fact again and again. Next slide. So as, I, as I've already mentioned, and I wanna summarize here, essentially to qualify for the next deceased organ that's offered to us, you have to be pretty sick. And, and, and those criteria are not determined by us. They're determined and monitored by the Trillium Gift of Life program. Um, uh, who, who, who oversees uh, all of our organ allocation as well. Uh, uh, and, and it's safe to say that, that if, if a deceased donor liver is donated to us tonight, it will be offered to the person on the waiting list in the same blood group that has the greatest risk of dying tomorrow. Uh, uh, meaning, meaning that if you are in the middle or lower part of the waiting list and clearly need a transplant, your chances of attracting that liver tonight aren't very good. And I, I don't think telling people that they need to get a lot sicker in order to have a transplant really is the way that we want to be going. Next slide. We do, we do, you know, try to keep our patients as healthy as we can for as long as we can while they're waiting. And, and they hear this repeatedly from us and from our nurse coordinators and from our nutritionists and our social workers. You know, while you're, list, while you're on the waiting list for a liver transplant, and we only have one waiting list for a liver transplant in the province of Ontario, uh, well, one for adults and one for kids. We ask our patients to stay as healthy as they can and remain as active as they can for as long as possible. We, we want to hear about new illnesses or concerns because those illnesses may affect their health, but it also as importantly may affect their ability or eligibility to undergo a transplant. Uh, we want to ensure that as their liver function declines, which unfortunately is the state case for most patients, that those complications are recognized early and treated appropriately. And most of our patients are managed primarily for those complications by their referring doctors in, in their communities. We, 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 we uh, see the patients on the waiting list on a regular basis to determine both whether they're still eligible to have a transplant and whether they're still fit to undergo one. Um, uh, because the waiting list is driven by your sodium melt score, um, we need regular blood tests. We typically ask for them on a monthly basis. Those, up, those blood tests are uploaded into the Trillium system, and that determines on any given day exactly what the order of the listed patients is. We, we want to be informed about changes in patient status. I always say to patients, if you end up hospitalized somewhere else, don't assume that the person looking after you in the emergency department is going to pick up the phone and call us and tell us that you're there. They might, and they should. But the, the safest thing to do is for you, yourself, or one of your family members just to call us, leave us a message saying, by the way, I'm calling on behalf of Mrs. or Mr. So-and-so, just to let you know that I had to take him to the emergency department last night at whatever hospital. And that way we can track down the lab results and, and we can try to reach out and contact the teams there to offer our assistance and reassurance uh, in terms of their management of our patients as well. There's, a, there's an old saying, that never assume anything because you just end up making an ass of you and me 
And I don't think that's ever truer than when you assume that we will automatically find out that you've been hospitalized, whether it's in uh, elsewhere in downtown Toronto or whether it's in a small hospital way up in Northwestern Ontario. We wanna know if, you're, if there's been any major changes in your health status, your, 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 your home address, your home telephone numbers and things like that. But the most important advice that we give to patients in our program once they're listed for liver transplant is to find themselves a living donor. Because my patients have long ago realized that sitting on a waiting list doesn't somehow make them any better. It's only when we're able to remove them from the waiting list with a liver transplant that we have a, a, a chance of improving both their life expectancy and their quality of that life as well. Next slide. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the living donor option. Um, I, I try to distill this down to three clear benefits of living donation. And the first benefit is the obvious one. Instead of having to become the sickest person or one of the sickest people in the province in order to qualify for the next deceased donor offer, you can, you can have your liver transplant when you're ready to do so. So waiting times are shortened by living donation and we get to transplant patients when they're healthier. That, that Goldilocks sweet spot that I talked about before. And when you transplant patients when they're healthier, you're, you can expect fewer complications, a shorter hospital stay and a faster return to good health afterwards. And that's the principal advantage is shortened waiting time. There's a second advantage that I highlight as well. Um, you know, a, a, as fatty liver disease has, has zipped through our population in North America, like, like, like a, I, I don't want to use the word pandemic lightly, but it's really been an epidemic. The quality of the livers that we get from deceased donors have suffered. And, and more and more of the deceased donor livers that were offered are unusable. However, if you receive albeit a piece of liver from a perfectly healthy person, and that liver is removed and walked across the hall, that's a better liver than you may get if you wait for a whole liver from a dead person, and that liver has been removed and shipped on ice halfway across the province. So you get, you, you get in general, a higher quality graph. Plus there are, there are always questions that we struggle to answer when we are informed about a potential deceased donor, and all those questions can be answered easily in the time that we have to sort out our potential living donors. The third advantage, and this is more relevant for our out-of-town patients, but actually relevant for, for others too, is that the surgery is scheduled. So you know weeks in advance, in most cases, when your liver transplant is going to take place. It allows people to make arrangements for childcare, for pet care, for, for, for disability, from work if they're still working, uh, to find accommodation in the greater Toronto area for that stay post-transplant that we do recommend for patients that travel a great distance. Um, uh, and I think it just makes the, 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 uh, the logistics of having a transplant much more straightforward as well. And the, the other benefit is to the donor themselves, because family members want to do everything they can to, to save the life of their loved one, not just family members, friends and relative, other relatives as well. Um, and, and giving them the option of becoming a living donor really lets them know that they've gone to the wall. They've done everything possible to help their loved one to uh, receive a liver transplant and have a good restoration of health. So there is that benefit as well. Next slide. Now, nothing that has benefit comes without a downside. The downside of living donation by definition is the fact that we have taken a person that's in perfectly good health by definition and we've operated on them. And no matter how slick my surgical team is, and they are very slick, and no matter how often they have done this, and it's more than a thousand times now, there is a risk associated with having liver surgery. There's a risk associated with having any, any surgery. Uh, and, that, and, and the donor themselves is undertaking all that surgical risk without benefit to them. The benefit is to the recipient. The, the recipient will, will, will enjoy longer and better quality life as a result. So given that all this risk is loaded on the donor, all efforts are made by our program to minimize donor risk. We can't eliminate it. All we can do is do our best to understand it, to minimize it, and to inform the donor exactly what they're getting themselves into. Next slide. Now, our living donor program, as mentioned, has passed the 1,000 mark. And until recently, we were 
year on year, the biggest living donor program in North America. And our friends in Pittsburgh passed this a couple of years ago. They actually recruit patients from all across the US and you may have seen their commercials on television looking for recipients. So they, they actually do more living donors than deceased donors in Pittsburgh. I don't know what they've done this calendar year, but last year they did. Uh, and that's because they serve not only the greater Pittsburgh area, but they actually recruit recipients from all over the country uh, programs across the US where living donor isn't offered. And most US programs don't offer living donation. We're second, uh, the third position last year was, was University of Texas, San Antonio. And you can see that actually with very few exceptions, most American programs do 20 or fewer living donor liver transplants where last year we did 54 adults and 23 kids. And this year we're already close. I think we're at 45 adults and I think 13 or 14 kids. So we'll set another record this year. So, and again, when you're undergoing a procedure like this, the experience of the importance of the experience of the donor team and the experience of the team caring for the recipients cannot be overemphasized. Next slide. Now, I, I don't want to give the impression that living donation is unusual. It's unusual in North America. But if you go to, this, to Southeast Asia or South Asia, you'll see that, that most liver transplants, in fact, in Japan, almost all liver transplants are done using living donors. It's, it's unusual for a patient in Japan to receive a deceased donor liver transplant. Over 80% of all transplants in India are done using living donors. Very high proportion of transplants in mainland China, Taiwan, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, places like that, all of them, the majority, and in some cases, the vast majority of liver transplants are done using living donor grafts. Toronto stands out, the US as a whole, as I showed you from that previous slide, even if you put together all 30 or so programs that do living donor transplants, most of them a handful a year, only 6% of all liver transplants in the US are done using living donors. It's growing, then it has to grow because the quality of their deceased donors is suffering just as ours is. In Toronto collectively, 30%, or I'll show you exactly, of transplants are done use, using living donors. So as, as, as Unusual as we are in the North American context, we're just not in the same league as programs in South Asia and Southeast Asia, as you can see, or even in the Middle East. I, and I didn't include places like Egypt and places like that. Our, our living donor program has been an important part of our adult liver transplant program since it started in April of 2000 with a patient of mine. And, and as I mentioned last year, we did 54 adult living donors and we're on a pace to exceed that quite easily this year as well. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that living donor liver transplantation makes up in the range of about 25 to 30% of our adult liver transplants. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, because size issues are, are set aside, if you look at the next slide, you'll see that the world of pediatrics is different. And there was one or two years, as you can see, where close to 80% of all pediatric transplants were done using living donors. And it means that death on the pediatric waiting list is very uncommon these days. Uh, and most of the time, of course, one of the parents steps forward to donate a piece of liver to one of their children. And we don't have the same concerns there about size or about blood group compatibility in most cases. So, so it's safe to say that while, while living donor transplant has, has rapidly improved access to transplant in adults, it's revolutionized access to transplant in the pediatric world and will continue to do so. Next slide. So the advantage, as I said, of living donor liver transplant, the recipients can be transplanted when they're healthier. The, they can be transplanted at a, at a lower MELT score, which as I mentioned is, is the quick and easy way of sort of deciding how sick somebody is. So let's look at the data on that. Next slide. You, you can see from this slide, I've plotted here, on the left-hand bars, the average sodium melt score of the patients undergoing a deceased donor transplant over the last several years. And the bars uh, on the right side in each pair are the average sodium melt scores of the patients for undergoing a living donor transplant. And you can see that the gap not only is there, but it's increasing as the, as this, as the illness, uh, the severity of illness in our recipients continues to go up. So we're able to transplant patients uh, with, with a sodium melt that's about eight points lower and that translates into healthier patients, shorter operations, and better outcomes. 
Next slide. The better outcomes we measure, of course, in terms of patient survival. I, I always like to say to my patients that we, we do liver transplants to make people live longer, not to make them feel better, but they do feel better in vast majority of cases when they do have a liver transplant, but it's much easier to track survival, of course, than quality of life. So whether you measure patient survival from the moment that they're listed, which is the next slide, which, re which reflects wait list mortality, you see a big difference there. The gap between the red line and the green line is the difference between life, life or death for patients. And you can see that the green line drops off extensively in the first couple of years after listing, and that reflects weightless mortality. And, and, and you can see that after, five, after 10 years or so, the difference in survival is about 30%. But that difference is present from almost literally the day after the transplant the, or the day after the patient is listed because you're able to take patients off the waiting list earlier by transplanting them. Next slide. We also, of course, look at survival from the date of transplant itself. And the next slide reflects that. It's a bit busy, this slide. Um, so let me just, I want you to focus on the, 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 the top red line. And I want you to focus on the, of the other three lines, the middle one that's there. If I go to the next slide, you'll see some circles there. But, and, and what I've done here, this is for the purposes of internal quality control, is that a couple of years back, I looked at our outcomes. And I looked at the first 10 years of our living donor program versus the second 10 years, because there is in these sorts of things, as you can imagine, kind of a learning curve. And you can see, if you look at the recipient survival in the last 10 years, 2000 through, 2010 through 2018, I guess that's nine years, in the top red line, you can see a five-year survival in excess of 90%, and a survival approaching 10 years, that's going to be uh, uh, in the upper 80% range. And you compare that to deceased donor survival, which is the blue line, you can see that the five-year survival after a deceased donor is, is, is 82%, and the 10-year survival drops off to 78%. So at all points in time, literally from the first month after transplant, patients who receive a living donor transplant are more likely to survive. And that largely reflects the fact that they were healthier the day before their transplant, but it also reflects the quality of the graft that, that they received. You know, it's more technically challenging for our surgical team to put a piece of liver in someone because they're dealing with smaller arteries and smaller veins and smaller bile ducts as well. And those technical challenges uh, uh, are, 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 can be quite considerable. But despite those technical challenges and the effect that they can have on graft function, the outcomes of living donor transplant continue to far exceed those of patients who have deceased donor transplant. And that's what the point of this is as well. So the, the success of transplant, and honestly, a 90% survival five years after a liver transplant is unheard of in the deceased donor transplant world. I have to remember this includes a fair number of patients with cancer as well. And you know, transplanting somebody with cancer one month after they're placed on the waiting list, instead of one year after they're placed on the waiting list, you don't have to be an expert on cancer to know what that will mean in terms of their risk of the cancer reappearing after transplant. And I haven't broken those patients out, but there's separate data that demonstrates that as well. So getting transplanted sooner is, 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 is almost always better. Next slide. So I, I told you a few slides ago how we determine when someone with liver disease uh, is sick enough that we should be thinking about a liver transplant. And, and I think I can spend a couple of minutes talking about how we determine when we have somebody that's on our waiting list, whether that person should be eligible for both a living donor and a deceased donor. First of, first of all, the decision to put somebody in the transplant list is not, is not dependent on whether they might or might not have a donor. That decision is made based on the severity of their liver disease and the likelihood that their long-term survival will be substantially improved with liver transplant, whatever, wherever the organ comes from. There's only one waiting list. Now we, we are doing some interesting clinical trials looking at unusual indications, but those are separate patients as well. And I think it's, it's probably safest to start by casting the net as wide as possible and say that virtually everyone that we list for a liver transplant can be considered for both living donation or deceased donation. There are a few exceptions. For example, if, if somebody is, is a particularly technically challenging patient, for example, somebody may have clotted off the major vessels that go to and from the liver. 
Somebody may have had extensive, extensive previous surgery in the right upper quadrant, the liver has to go, or other anatomical considerations. Um, the patients may have already had a liver transplant. It might be, might be a need for a second liver transplant. Those patients uh, often are just technically not doable, but that's a pretty small number of patients. I think it's safe to say that, that right off the bat, the vast majority of our recipients are going to be eligible to receive either type of transplant. Now, the other big group that we need to talk about, it's not a big group, but it's an important group. Um, when, when patients get very, very sick, uh, I, I talked earlier about the fact that, that as patients get sick, particularly if they have multi-organ failure, even more so if they're on life support, the risks of transplant start to go up. These are not your ideal surgical candidates. And, and when you're transplanting someone like that, which, which we will still do in, 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 in certain cases, those patients might be better served with a, with a deceased donor graft because the deceased donor graft doesn't need weeks to months to, re, to regenerate. And that person in receiving a deceased donor graft will enjoy a more rapid return to normal liver function and a better chance of weathering the other complications that landed them in the ICU in the first place. So this is the other thing is that once patients get very, very ill, living donor transplant often comes off the table. And the other factor, of course, is, is that we're then talking about putting a healthy individual life at risk for increasingly marginal outcomes in the recipient as well. And it's very difficult for us. We struggle with that ethically, of course, all the time. But I, the summary would say that I would estimate uh, that, that at least 80% of all the patients that we list for a liver transplant and probably more are at some point or another eligible to receive either a living donor or a deceased donor. Next slide. So what does a living donor look like? Well, like just about anybody, um, a, a healthy individual between 16 and 60 years of age, we actually have had 16 year olds that have stepped forward to be potential donors. Uh, they, they obviously can't have significant liver disease, that's kind of a given. And their liver function has to be entirely normal, of course, not only for the sake of the recipient, but for the sake of the donor, so that the liver regenerates fully with good return to function. Um, ABO compatibility is nice. Um, if you're sitting on, on the waiting list and you're hoping for a deceased donor, we're only allowed to give you the same blood group. For example, you know, if you're an A, you get an A, because if we gave all the O's to the A's, then the O's would never get transplanted. This just wouldn't be fair. However, if you have a living donor and that donor is compatible and you're an A, it doesn't matter anymore if that donor is an O or an A, because you're not taking that liver away from someone else. The, the, biggest, the biggest medical problem that we run into in our donors is the donors have fatty liver. And I already mentioned on a couple of occasions how common fatty liver is. So we want our donors to have a normal body mass index, which is that number we work out with your height and weight, uh, or, or minimally elevated body mass index. And we want to be as certain as we can that the liver isn't fatty. You know, we'll tolerate a little bit of fat, but not a lot. Um, and the fat, a fatty liver, not only is it bad for the recipient, because they're getting a liver that's not perfect. And when you're giving them a, only a piece of liver, you want it to be as perfect as you can. But it's also not good for the donor because the fatty liver is more likely to struggle post-op and less likely to achieve prompt and complete regeneration. So we, we, we won't use uh, livers from donors that are overly fatty because we, we don't feel the risks to both people can be justified. However, uh, if the donors are overweight, and they are able to lose weight and bring their body mass index down, most of those donors actually will become donors in the long term, and we can use their livers as well. And those donors sometimes actually benefit in many other ways from the changes in diet and weight that, that we instituted as well. The donor has to be the right height and weight so that the livers are approximately the same size. We, we, we have this, this uh, issue. We have to make sure the recipient gets enough liver uh, to, to uh, keep them alive while the liver grows back, yet we can't take too much from the donor without putting the donor at higher risk. We remove, we remove up to 70% of an adult's liver to do this. That's a lot. And we want to make sure that we, that we don't overly jeopardize the donor's health while still maintaining our excellent outcomes in the recipient. Um, each and every one of us is put together a little differently in there. Our arteries and our veins and bile ducts are different. And you want to be, want to be sure that, you, that the remnant that you leave in the donor has an adequate supply of vessels and ducts. And the piece you put in the recipient is also well served. And we do end up excluding many donors every year 
simply because it's not technically possible to work with that liver because of extra arteries and veins and things like that as well. The statistic that we say is that of every five people that step forward to be a living donor, only between one and two of those individuals actually ends up successfully donating their liver. Most of the time because of issues that are identified in the donor, occasionally, unfortunately, because the recipients become themselves ineligible for a liver transplant or on a few nice occasions actually get transplanted during the assessment process. It's also finally important that the donor has a good understanding of both the processes involved in doing this and the risks. This is a big deal. We're asking healthy people, often people in the prime of their productive lives with families and jobs and, and, and lives, to put all of that on hold, to undergo an operation that they don't need to, to improve and restore the health of someone else. And we have to be certain that they know exactly what they're getting themselves into. Next slide. Donor safety is and has to always be our number one priority. And I'm pleased to say that after doing 1,000 of these, we've had no donors that have died as a result of donating their liver. Now, we've been doing this for over 20 years, and we've had donors that have gone on to die of other things, but I don't think we can take the blame for that. Uh, we also have had no donors that have had any, any form of long-term or long-standing disability related to organ donation. These are the people that have become our donors. This, this, this data is, uh, is approximate because I, I haven't updated the database uh, to allow for all 1,000 donors. About two thirds of our living donors are blood relations to the recipient. And in the adult world, it's usually one of the adult children donating to one of their parents. Um, in, in, the, in the pediatric world, it's usually one of the parents donating to the child, as I mentioned earlier. Of the one third of living donors who aren't genetically related, about 20% are spouses and about half are friends. Um, we also have a substantial number of, of donors that donate anonymously. These are people that have heard about the need for liver transplantation and step forward and offer to donate a piece of their liver uh, to a stranger. And they, they usually offer in the setting of, 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 of a child. And so we, we have a fair number of children that have undergone living donor liver transplants from complete strangers. The median donor age is 35. And, and whereas the median donor age in our deceased donors is close to 60. And this goes back to the issue of the quality of the graft that you get. Not only will a liver work better if it comes from a younger person, but it will regenerate more efficiently and effectively if it comes from a younger person as well. Next slide. We, we are very careful to maintain uh, silos in our program, and we have separate teams that are involved in the assessment and care of recipients and the assessment and care of donors. And, and, and although we understand how, 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 how this would happen, our, our, our recipients are strongly discouraged from chasing down the living donor program to find out what's happening with their donor. We're not allowed to tell the recipient anything about the donor's health, anything about what the donor is in evaluation because we cannot violate patient confidentiality. Now, in most cases, because the donor is a relative of the recipient, this can be remedied by the donor speaking to the, the recipient speaking to the donors themselves, and that usually solves the problem. But this is a source of some frustration and friction in our living donor office. Next slide. So how do you become a living donor? Well, if you're aware of someone on our waiting list who needs a transplant and you wanna help, and it's usually because that someone is a loved one of yours and you, you wanna help them, you can uh, uh, log on to uhntransplant.ca and download the donor history form and complete it and send it in. And if you have access to it, we would like to get a copy of your blood type. You can either send in a picture of your blood donor card or ask your primary doctor to uh, do some simple blood tests, including your blood type as well. And once we receive the referral um, and verify that the recipient is indeed on our waiting list, then we would start the assessment by contacting the Living Donor Program. Next slide. This is a very resource intensive business. And, and we, we have a practice of assessing one donor at a time per recipient. So we assess the donor applications, we assess them quickly, but we assess them in the order that they come in. We try to book the tests for the donor at the donor's convenience. These are donors are usually people in their 30s and 40s, as I mentioned, who are working, who have families. Uh, they're not always within spitting distance of downtown Toronto. Uh, so we try to organize the tests at their convenience and that does delay things a bit. But we, the, on average, from the moment the application is received, 
So the moment the donor actually donates is typically about eight weeks. Now, it's important to realize that, that we do, of course, serve a population of recipients whose donors are going to be from outside of Ontario. And, and in fact, the very first living donor transplant that we did, the donor actually came from the US, which represented a whole other set of challenges, as you can probably imagine. But, but um, you know, it's important to realize that, say, for example, we have an Ontario recipient and we have a donor coming from, for example, Manitoba, um, the, the, the direct medical costs to that donor, blood work, scans, the hospital stay, things like that, are actually covered by the recipient's healthcare. Indirect costs such as travel, accommodation, medications, and things like that are not covered, but each province does have a program in place where they can, they can help to reimburse the living donors for some of their costs. It's called the pre law program in Ontario. Uh, it has its flaws, of course, as well, but it does help to defray some of, the, some of the costs involved in becoming a living donor. It doesn't replace employment income, and that's an issue as well. We also, as I mentioned, have, have had donors that have approached our program from around the world. I mean, anybody who's, who's uh, attended any of my liver clinics realized that it looks like a little mini United Nations General Assembly session. And therefore, many of our recipients have family members that are interested in donating that live all over the world. And, and we've had donors that have come from Europe and from Asia and from Australia and from the Mideast and from, from, from Japan and places like that. That has really kind of dried up because of this whole COVID business as well. It's very difficult now for us to get our donors here and get them assessed, but we remain optimistic as travel restrictions lighten and as uh, the world goes back to normal or the new normal, that this will again be an important part of our program. We basically are the living donor program in, in, in the country of Canada. And we have transplanted recipients also from British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, of course, uh, from Quebec and from the Maritimes because we have the depth and breadth of experience that's unequaled in North America, and in fact, unequaled in the Western world. So we, we do consider recipients for living donor transplant if they are listed in other liver transplant programs across the country. And we've, I've met recently, I've gone out, I've, I've spoken to Manitoba, I've spoken to BC, I've gone out to, to Halifax and the Maritimes to, to ensure that, that we, are, we are able to offer this service for recipients across the country. The thing I wanted to mention last is the secondary benefit of living donation. If you're a recipient on the waiting list and a family member steps forward and you receive a transplant for, for, through that route, that has freed up the deceased donor that you didn't need for the next person on the waiting list. So our living donor may actually have the satisfaction of knowing that not only has their gift helped to restore the life and quality of life of the recipient they gave it to, but it also indirectly may save a second life on the waiting list. And that goes back to that big gap that we see every day between supply and demand. I call this slide the rule of sixes. It doesn't say six on the slide. The donor surgery takes at least six hours. The donors stay in hospital for an average of six days and they return to work at about six weeks. I guess I should maybe call it the rule of sevens. The liver grows back, of course. And within, within three months, actually well within three months, both the donor and the recipient have already over 85 to 90% of a full size liver. It returns to normal size and normal function within a few months of the surgery. And this is why this works. Next slide. Once the recipients are transplanted, their recovery is as appropriate as you would expect given their disease and given their age. And because living donor recipients are transplanted at earlier stages of their disease, they often recover faster. They're back home, they're back working, or they're back doing all the things they want to do sooner because they didn't have to wait for a liver uh, and become the sickest person on the whole waiting list. All of our recipients are followed through our transplant clinics. We monitor them closely for rejection, for signs of infection, for other complications. And those recipients that come to us from Winnipeg and Hamilton and Kingston and Ottawa are ultimately followed through their local transplant clinics there. And we give all, all of our patients the same advice as we give to each other. Stay safe and enjoy the gift of life that you've received. And I think that is the last I have to say. If we go to the very last slide, I just re remind you of, of uh, potential donors of how to reach us, uhntransplant.ca. 
and separate sites on, on the hospital website that actually link you to the living donor program. Just be careful if you want to become a living donor that you don't go down the kidney route instead of the liver route. It happens. Nobody's actually ended up donating the wrong organ, but you got to click right, you know. So uh, we have time for a few questions. Well, how do the first question is how do patients know if they're on the liver transplant list? Well, well, the, our program, like all programs, meets every week, and patients are discussed and listed for transplant. And the patients are contacted the same day to inform them that they've been listed for transplant. Patients often assume, you know, they refer to us. We see them once. We say yes. We think we should probably. Uh, start the testing to get you on the transplant list. The patients hear the word transplant list and they assume they're on the list. They're not. They're not listed for transplant until we've answered those three questions. Do they need a transplant? Do they have uh, uh, any prohibitive risks to having a transplant? And do they have an excellent network of support and free of substance abuse? And we do not determine those things in the, in the one hour we spend with the patient on day one. So we call the patients once they're listed. The risk of living liver donation. Well, I mean, we quote, a risk of death to the donor of approximately one in 500. Um, uh, and, and that is based on worldwide data because it, it is indeed true, sadly, that living donors around the world have died following living donation. Fortunately, it hasn't happened in Canada and it hasn't happened in our program. A risk of death of about one in 500 or less. There are serious complications that can follow any major operation, bleeding, infection, things like that, that don't lead to death, but may lead to a second operation, blood transfusions, a longer hospital stay. And those are run in the one to 2% range. And then there's a long list of minor complications that can range from swollen ankles to a, to a bruise where the IV was put in, and those will run up to the 10 to 20% range. Nevertheless, the average length of stay continues to be six point something days following liver, liver, living liver donation. The next question, I live in BC and was told I could not have a living donor transplant here. Well, that is, that is not true. We have a relationship with the programs in, in, in the Maritimes uh, and, and in Alberta and in British Columbia, given that we are essentially the Canadian Center for Living Donation. Um, uh, if, if, if somebody is eligible for a transplant in another province and, th and that program is not able to offer them living donation, then we would like the patient to be referred to us to receive a living donor transplant in our hands as well. And, and, and you know, I have spoken myself to the physicians in these other programs. They're aware that we offer this service. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't think I rub anybody the wrong way and when I present this to them as well, because we all benefit when our, trans, when our patients get transplanted, whether they're transplanted here or a thousand kilometers from here. Um, your doctor needs to be reminded that Toronto is prepared to offer living donation for recipients who need transplants, even if they're listed in other programs across the country. The next question I sort of addressed, I was unwell and not sure if I'm still on the waiting list. Well, well we do occasionally have to put patient, patients on the waiting list on hold because they've developed an illness or complication that for the moment prevents us from transplanting them. And the usual complication is that they have an active infection. And given that we introduce high dose immunosuppression, during their transplant, we don't want to take patients to the OR with an untreated infection. So we do advise, most of the time these patients are in hospital and they're advised that we've had to place you on hold for a few days. And then they're advised when we take them off hold. And I, I agree that that communication is sometimes imperfect, but, but we do tell our patients when they go, and their patients may also go on hold because they're not doing their blood tests on time. They may go on hold because they're not up to date for their scans or they may be suspended which Trillium does. So we try our very best to keep each and every of our 250 listed patients apprised as to their status. We do our best. The next question is, do you accept patients from the East Coast? Uh, well, yes, we do. They need to be referred by their physicians for transplant, just as we accept patients from the West Coast. Do, do women have different symptoms of liver failure? Well, women have different liver diseases, absolutely. Um, and, and, and women and, and, and different diseases present in different ways. But fundamentally, once you've got cirrhosis, your symptom complex is going to be roughly the same. 
We see higher rates of autoimmune liver diseases in women. We see higher rates of alcoholic liver disease in men. And we see equally high rates of fatty liver in both. And most of the time, by the time we transplant patients, they have profound fatigue, salt and water retention, uh, short-term memory loss or worse, or cancer. And those are not going to be radically different in the, based on gender. How do we continue to encourage people needing a transplant to keep going? Well, we do our best, and it's not any easier in the pandemic world to do so. We do have uh, psychosocial support. We have a, a dedicated social workers and psychiatrists that work with us as well. We encourage our patients to work with their local providers, um, their family doctors, and their local uh, clinics as well to do so. Um, and I, you know, I, I see patients on Wednesday afternoons on the liver transplant list, and basically it's one long pep talk. And that's what we try and do. We try to be objective to tell people exactly, you know, where they are and what they can expect. But at the same time, we don't want our patients to give up. The next question is, uh, an extremely healthy 56-year-old wants to donate part of his or her liver to a child in need. Um, and they enjoy a daily glass of wine. Well, well, although most of us would acknowledge that a daily glass of wine is not harmful, if you're considering giving a piece of that liver that's having a glass of wine every day to somebody else, we do ask our potential donors to give up all alcohol use for about six weeks before donating. Um, uh, and and, and we, we, we do trust them to follow our advice as well. And, and because we, you know, we acknowledge the fact that we're giving somebody a piece of liver. I said that before. And we want to do everything we can to ensure that that piece is as healthy as possible and will work as fast as it needs to. And anything that we can do to the donor, with the donor to improve the quality of the liver and anything that we can do for the recipients to improve their outcome, we're going to do. So about a six week. There are also certain medications the donors might be on. Birth control pills, for example, those have to be discontinued because they do increase the risk of post-op blood clots and things like that as well. It's very individualized beyond that. Um, again, I'm not gonna be able to get to all of these. Um, I, I, you know, The discussion of transplant medications could take hours as well. Our patients are, go on lifelong anti-rejection drugs. Liver patients, fortunately, are at lower risk of rejection all along than patients who receive hearts and lungs and kidney transplants. But I think it's safe to say that outside of some experimental settings, lifelong immunosuppression is necessary, usually with a single agent. In about a third of our patients, it's with two agents long-term. And, and in less than 5% of our patients, it's with three agents long-term. Other than that, I just don't have the time to go into detail. This is discussed with the recipients both at the time of their assessment, but more importantly, at the time of their visits to the, to the clinic. I'm afraid it's after one. And, and although I didn't get to all the questions, I did my best. I think we have to call it to a close because, you know, frankly, I have a patient waiting too. So I hope that I was able to shed some light on this complicated and very dynamic topic. And I thank the members of the audience for their attention.